Hey, uh, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, shout out to the Voxel 51 crew. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And as soon as I hit play on this, you will see a presentation. All right, cool. What's up, everybody? Uh, today I'm here to talk about uh, Desi Diffusion. It's a uh, diffusion model that we built here at Desi and we released um, just a little over a month ago. Um, actually, just almost a month ago, actually. Uh, my name is Harpreet Sahota. I'm DevRel Manager at Desi. And um, let's jump to it. So the TLDR, uh, well, Desi Diffusion 1.0 is a 1.02 billion parameter uh, text to image latent diffusion model. Uh, it was trained on the Lion V2 data set and then fine-tuned on the Lion Art data set. Um, we used some advanced training techniques to speed up training, improve performance, and achieve better inference uh, speed and generation quality. And that is what I'm going to get into throughout this presentation. So just a brief uh, agenda of what we'll talk about. Uh, we'll walk through a fairly comprehensive overview of Desi Diffusion 1.0, uh, start with an introduction, go into some technical aspects, discuss um, kind of uh, what it's improving upon compared to Stable Diffusion 1.5, um, and then, you know, some some more details. Uh, so I'm excited to share these details with you, and hopefully you find this uh, session informative. So just kind of bring everyone up to speed real quick, to do a quick overview on what a latent diffusion model is. Uh, these are models that are an approach to uh, generate high-resolution images. At their core, it's um, they, they, they map a data set's underlying structure to a simplified latent space. And one of the features they they have is their ability to convert a text description directly into an image. Um, and this is leveraging an image generator network. Um, they also uh, employ something called progressive growing. And how this works is that the latent diffusion model is trained on a set of low resolution images. And then those uh, resolutions are gradually increased um, as it produces higher resolution outputs. And so what this allows the model and the network to do is learn kind of fine, finer grained details of images and generate more realistic results. Um, diffusion models, latent diffusion models have a wide range of applications. It can go from anything from enhancing image resolution and kind of filling in missing image parts to um, an ability to transform a text description into visual art. And um, I want to start by talking about Stable Diffusion 1.5. Um, and this this is kind of like a quote-unquote competitor model. This is like what we're trying to to recreate uh, with Desi. Um, so Stable Diffusion 1.5 is a, a 1.07 billion parameter latent text-to-image diffusion model. And this just transforms textual descriptions into photorealistic images. Um, and so a kind of a little bit of history, like the stable diffusion version 1.5 checkpoint was initialized from the stable diffusion version 1.2 checkpoint. It was then fine tuned, um, for 595,000 steps at a resolution of 512 by 512 on the Leon aesthetics version two five plus data set. Uh, then during fine tuning, 10% of the text conditioning was dropped to enhance a classifier free guidance sampling. Uh, and then the model combined an auto encoder with a diffusion model that was trained in the latent space of the auto encoder. Uh, then it also uses a, a VIT L14 text decoder uh, for text prompts and a UNET backbone for the latent diffusion model. So just a high level overview of stable diffusion uh, 1.5. So what does all that mean? How does how does all that work, right? Uh, so latent diffusion starts with a, a kind of a rudimentary, noisy image representation in the latent space. And then with text guidance and something like, you know, a drawing of a pint of beer on a brick wall, right? That would be the text guidance. The model is able to progressively refine this representation until it gradually unveils a denoised image that represents that text. Uh, so after several iterations, this representation in the latent space is, you know, expanded to a high resolution image. Um, and there's really three core components of, of a latent diffusion model. There's the text encoder, 
Um, this is the part that transforms a textual prompt into a latent text embedding, uh, which is then used by the UNET decoder. And so the UNET decoder is a uh, iterative encoder decoder mechanism that introduces uh, and helps reduce noise in the latent images. So the decoder uses some cross attention layers, uh, conditioning output on text embeddings uh, that are linked to that description. And then there's the uh, variational autoencoder or the, the VE. And this uh, transforms images into latent representations and vice versa. So the encoder converts an image into a latent version during training, while the decoder reverses this during training and inference. Uh, this, you know, some challenges though with Stable Diffusion 1.5. Uh, it's groundbreaking. It's, you know, it was amazing. Uh, it still is amazing, but it has its set of limitations, especially in terms of efficiency and quality of degenerated images. Um, it's got really high computational demand. And so this poses some challenges in deployment because it leads to latency uh, concerns and latency concerns, you know, that translates into real-time user uh, dissatisfaction, right? So this computational intensity also translates to increased cost, especially with image generation. So the model's inefficiency with iterations means that it requires more steps to achieve desired image quality. Um, that also uses a linear beta schedule and has a very resource intensive unit component. So it's just, you know, as great as the, the model is at generating images, it's kind of inefficient. Um, and it's also sample, uh, it's less sample efficient. So you need more diffusion time steps during inference to achieve a high quality result. So we figured we'll try to build a model that will improve upon Stable Diffusion 1.5. Um, so the result is a, a model that has enhanced efficiency, that's able to achieve the same quality of image in fewer iterations. Um, and when you couple this with uh, Inferi, which is uh, our, our uh, inference engine, proprietary in inference engine, engine uh, the density diffusion model ends up being three times faster and it produces high quality images more swiftly. Um, again, this translates to cost savings, um, which is important. 66% reduction in cost for every 10,000 image generated. Um, we introduced a cosine beta schedule and then a new unit that we called unit NAS that optimizes the model's performance. Um, and it's also sample efficient because uh, we're able to produce top tier results with fewer diffusion time steps. So let's go into this uh, in a little bit more detail. So I mentioned that we uh, came up with a new unit called unit NAS. Um, so you know, the, the challenge with the unit in Stable Diffusion 1.5 is that it's resource intensive uh, and this resource intensivity during training and inference. Um, there's a repetitive noising and denoising process that is stacking up and racking up computational costs at every iteration. And so at DESI, our main thing, like the thing that we do is uh, neural architecture search. We have something called the AutoNAC engine, which is a proprietary uh neural architecture search algorithm. Um, and using this, uh, this, this, uh, the auto NAC engine, neural architecture construction engine, um, we discovered a new unit. And so we dubbed this unit NAS. And so unit NAS has uh, two fewer up and down blocks than the stable diffusion unit. Um, and it's uh, adjustable. Um, that's a unique aspect of it. Um, it's the adjustable composition in each block. And so we optimize the number of ResNet and attention blocks. And so this helps us get maximum performance with minimal computation. Um, so by integrating this unit NAS, which has fewer parameters and improved computational efficiency, um, it leads to our model, Desi Diffusion, being more resource efficient than Stable Diffusion 1.5. Um, so the unit NAS that we have was trained on a 320 million uh, sample subset of the Lion data set and fine-tuned with a uh, 2 million sample subset of the Lion art data set. Um, the unit uh, NAS itself, I think it has 820 million parameters in it. Um, so it's a, a reduction compared to Stable Diffusion 1.5. Um, 
And we'll talk about that just a, a little bit more. So the main kind of architecture um, of Density Diffusion 1.0, it's the same foundational architecture elements that we talked about from Stable Diffusion 1.5. Like it's got the variational autoencoder and the CLIPS uh, pre-trained text encoder. But the, the big uh, innovation we had was substituting the UNET in Stable Diffusion 1.5 with our more efficient UNET NAS. Um, and so this helps streamline the model by reducing the number of parameters. And this, and you know, reducing the number of parameter means greater computational efficiency. Um, so let's just real quickly talk about the uh, training process of Desi Diffusion. So it was trained to be sample efficient and to produce high quality results using fewer diffusion time steps at inference. And so to achieve this, we had kind of a four phase training process. Phase one, trained from scratch for 1.28 million steps at a resolution uh, 256 by 256 on 320 million sample subset of line V2. Phase two, trained for 870,000 steps at resolution 512 by 512 on that same data set to learn more fine grained detailed uh, information. Phase three, we trained for 65,000 steps using exponential moving average um, and then another learning rate scheduler um, that we'll talk about later and more kind of qualitative data. And then in phase two, we fine tuned on a 2 million uh, sample subset of line art data set. Some more details regarding training. Um, in phase one, we used uh, eight, eight core A100s, um, Adam W as the optimizer with the batch size of 8,192 and the learning rate you see there, uh, one E to negative four. And then phase two, use the same hardware, uh, but use the LAM optimizer with a smaller batch size and a, uh, a higher learning rate. So again, like I mentioned, we use specialized training techniques to shorten the training time and arrive at higher quality images with uh, fewer iterations. So let's talk about those training tricks that we used. So one, if you recall, uh, you know, the, the Desk Diffusion Unit DAS, uh, was trained on a 320 million sample subset of the Lion data set and then fine-tuned with a 2 million sample subset of the Lion Art data set. And so really we only trained the UNET part of the latent diffusion model. We didn't need to compute the uh, variational autoencoder latents or the clip embeddings every time for every image. So we computed them once before training and then used the stored version later. This way, we end up saving about 20 to 50% of computation for every epoch. Um, the stable diffusions variational autoencoder, this gives us uh, average values and, and kind of like the moment distribution um, for, for these hidden data patterns. And we store those values and we use them when, when we're training. So this lets us add some randomness to the process, even with the data, uh, you know, even when using data that we've you know, prepared in advance. Technique two was just using exponential moving average only for the last phase of training. Um, so we found that using exponential moving average, uh, the initial changes to the weights don't really affect the final outcome that much. So exponential moving average is expensive because we need to store extra weight data and spend time aligning two sets of weights. So given how long training takes, um, it's not really worth using exponential moving average for the you know, major, majority of the first training steps, uh, of the early training steps. So by not using that, we are able to handle bigger data batches and then speed up training by only about, you know, 15%. Uh, so uh, benefit there as well. So next, I want to talk about how we're able to generate images that are on par with stable diffusion, but with 40% fewer iterations. So like I said, our model was trained to be sample efficient. Uh, so to produce high quality results using fewer diffusion time steps during the inference process. And we did this by combining a few techniques. Uh, the first technique um, here was um, uh, well, a couple of techniques that we're gonna talk about. One was cosine beta schedules and then uh, uh, another one that we'll get to in a second. But with the stable diffusion 1.5s, uh, beta scheduling, we found that we could skip one third of the final steps without a major drop in um, the FID score. Uh, I, 
always forget how to pronounce it, like Ferrache information uh, distance, something like that. Uh, this is just a metric for gauging the quality of text image models. But uh, we found that we could skip one third of the final steps without dropping that score, without a major drop in that score. So this meant that the linear beta schedules might not be making the best use of the model's learning potential. So you know, simplifying that, it just means that the model might be turning random noise into different random noise. Um, so we decided to switch to the cosine beta schedule. And this was a method that was pioneered um, at OpenAI by A. Nicole and P. Dariwal. And the paper was called Improved Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Models. And so we used a cosine beta schedule and were able to better harness the model's learning capabilities. So that meant that the model can now more accurately determine how noise is added to the images. So this change not only allows for sharper noise predictions, but also speeds up the image generation process. So as a result, our model is now uh, more operating more efficiently and producing images of higher quality. And so just to double click on that part about the noise scheduling. So in linear schedule, noise is added uniformly at each step. So this means that the images become almost purely noise towards the end of the diffusion process. So the problem arises though during the reverse process when the model is trying to recreate the original image from a noisy version. So a lot of the steps might just be converting one type of noise to another type of noise. And this doesn't contribute much to the final image quality. So some steps end up being redundant. On the other hand, if we use a cosine schedule, this varies the noise addition in a nonlinear manner. So this is ensuring that every diffusion process step is meaningful and contributing positively to the final image quality. Um, so the, this, this also helps us kind of optimize the, the model capacity. Um, so when I say model capacity, that just means the model's ability to learn and represent complex functions or patterns in data. So with the linear schedule, the model capacity might not be fully utilized since some steps are becoming redundant. And you can kind of see this in the picture here. Um, you know, it could help. It potentially could lead to inefficiencies and overfitting. Uh, you know, being more complex though, the cosine schedule challenges the model throughout the learning process. So this ensures that there's a more robust learning experience, so to say, and it's using the model's capacity fully. Um, you know, due to the redundancy in linear schedule, there's a lot of you know, you're wasting computational resources, essentially. And this is evidence during the reverse process because some steps, again, are just transforming one kind of noise into another without improving the image quality. Um, so with the cosine schedule, since every step is meaningful, the model can potentially work faster during the inference phase. Um, so it's able to produce outputs without going through all the usual steps and still achieving good results. Another strategy that I hinted at earlier uh, was the min signal to noise gamma loss weighting strategy. So when we combine this with the cosine schedule, um, so the, this uh, min signal to noise gamma loss weighting strategy, this was uh, introduced in a 2003 research paper, so, uh, sorry, 2023 research paper that just came out earlier this year by T. Hang and others. Uh, it was called uh, Efficient Diffusion Training via Min-SNR Weighting Strategy. Um, so the, the Min-SNR Gamma Weighting Loss loss Weighting Strategy is designed to optimize the training of a diffusion model. So what it does is that it assigns weight to each time step based on their difficulty, and it uses a clamped signal-to-noise ratio as the determining factor for those weights. So Essentially, this, the strategy is recognizing that not all time steps in the diffusion model, uh, sorry, in the diffusion process are equally challenging or, or crucial. So those intermediate steps during which, you know, we're often kind of learning intricate patterns and subtle details are really important for the model to, to learn. So if we give those greater importance uh, through the min SNR gamma weighting, then the model uh, is guided to focus more on those intermediate steps. And this leads to more robust learning and, uh, you know, of the, of the nuances in that diffusion process. Um, on the other hand, those time steps that are characterized by uh, minimal noise levels are downweighted. So this decision is rooted in the understanding that minor noise variations are less perceptible to the human eye. 
right? So by de-emphasizing those steps, the strategy uh, ensures that the model doesn't waste resources on aspects that have a limited impact on the perceived quality of the generated images. So to sum it up, it's a strategy uh, is deliberate, deliberate and calculated approach to balance the model's focus across the diffusion process. So we're directing the model's attention to the most impactful time steps, and we're ensuring that there's an optimal use of learning capacity for really, really good image generation. Uh, so next, uh, talk about a few of the steps that we use to effectively capture the data distribution. Now, one of them was progressive distillation. Um, so one thing that we did was the training and inference procedures were optimized to capture the data distribution better. Um, accurately capturing the data distribution is critical, especially when you're working with a few time steps during inference, right? And so the optimization technique here um, was influenced by the findings um, of Shan Chuan, Lin, and others in a 2023 paper uh, called Common Diffusion Noise Schedules and Samples Are Flawed. And so we drew heavily from the research in this paper. We've used uh, some of the findings uh, quite a few times. But Lin's team identified that there's a, a lot of inconsistencies in diffusion noise schedules that often leads to models producing kind of medium brightness images, even when the prompts suggested otherwise. Um, so in their research, they were able to achieve a more harmonious alignment between training and inference by ensuring that a, a zero terminal signal to noise ratio and implemented other fixes like adjusting the noise schedule, switching to V prediction, and then always sampling from the last timestamp. So this alignment is super important, especially when you're operating with limited uh, resources and time steps during inference. So this kind of meticulous attention to detail, so to speak, ensures that the model generates high quality images, but it's still versatile and responsive to a diverse range of inputs. Um, so by better capturing the data distribution, we're you know confidently producing visual, uh, visually appealing images that align with the intended intended uh, uh, prompts, even when there's a constraint on the number of inference times time steps. So I mentioned V prediction. Um, so we talk about that. So the the, the final step of the models uh, uh, process we used. Uh, something called v-prediction. And this is kind of how it works, right? So if you imagine that you have an image that is just covered in noise that makes it look blurry or dis distorted, uh, and, and consider this noisy image as your starting point. So typically, diffusion models will try to remove this noise step by step, right? Step by step, denoising it and revealing this clear image underneath it. Um, it's kind of like peeling layers off an onion. But with v-prediction, the model takes a different approach. So instead of peeling the layers, we're just trying to guess, directly guess what the image is going to look like in one go. Uh, so the initial noise isn't discarded. It's used as like a hint or as a clue. And so the model looks at this noise and then tries to figure out what the original image might have been. So it's trying to like trying to guess the original picture of a jigsaw puzzle by just looking at a few scattered pieces. So in the final step, the model isn't even just trying to remove random noise. It's trying to guess or predict the clear image based on hints that were provided in the initial noise. Um, and there's another method called epsilon prediction. Uh, and in epsilon prediction, the model is slowly and gradually removing noise over several time steps. It's a more cautious approach, and it takes more time to reveal the clear image. So you know that's not what we're doing here. We're using V prediction. So we're just I'm trying to get a more direct and efficient route to the clear image. And so this, if we couple V prediction with the signal to noise, uh, well, rather V prediction becomes very useful when the signal to noise ratio is zero. Um, and uh, the traditional methods might struggle in a case like this, but V prediction is more robust, um, gives a better solution. So it's recommended to always use reprediction for your model. Um, and you can adjust certain parameters like gamma sub T to achieve different loss weightings if you need. Um, so when sampling with a, a terminal, zero terminal signal to noise ratio, it's really important to handle V predictions correctly. Otherwise you might run into some problems. 
Another optimization strategy we use is skipping step zero. Um, so we wanted to produce clear, more vivid images in as few steps as possible, um, and you know, saving computation and inference. So again, we uh, adopted a strategy from that paper I mentioned in the last slide by uh, Lynn and others. And the key element of this strategy is the intentional skipping of step zero, which is the final step in the review, reverse diffusion process. So why is this important? Well, because the noise level at this step is so subtle that is virtually invisible to the human eyes. So this means that the image produced at the next step, time step one, looks almost identical to what you'd get if you included step zero. So by skipping step zero during the image generation process, we're strategically deciding where to focus our model's uh, kind of attention and resources. Um, so instead of wasting effort on a step that doesn't really noticeably change the image, we're just concentrating more on the steps that matter. And, you know, th these are the steps that really shape the image's overall look and, and content. And the end result is a model that produces images with crisp details um, that does show various features and styles, uh, but with, you know, less cost of inference. Um, so it, it does also, it, it underscores the significance of the earlier steps in the process. So those earlier steps play a pivotal role in determining the final image's structure and content. Less of a pivotal role than the uh, towards the end of the diffusion process. Um, so based on um, subjective evaluation surveys and, and FID scores, uh, Desi Diffusion's quality at 30 iterations is on par with or better than Stable Diffusion 1.5 at 50 iterations. Uh, on average, Desi Diffusion uh, generates images um, after 30 iterations, um, you know, gets a co co comparable uh, inception distance, FID score, um, gener then, then Stable Diffusion 1.5 at 50 iterations. Um, so again, FID is used to assess kind of the, the text image models, and it compares the distribution of the, of the model-generated images with the real or ground truth images. So lower FID score means that the images uh, have a close resemblance to the real images. Uh, for our study, we chose 10 uh, random prompts, and then for each prompt, generated three images by Stable Diffusion 1.5, uh, configured to run at 50 iterations, and then three images by Desi Diffusion configured to run for 30 iterations. And then we presented 30 side-by-side -side comparisons to professionals who then voted on adherence to the prompt and aesthetic value. And the results right here. Um, so Desi Diffusion uh, at 30 iterations gives um, an edge in aesthetics, but it's on par with Stable Diffusion uh, at 50 iterations. Um, and we're going to see it in action. I think we still got a little bit of a uh, few more minutes here. So um, what I want you guys to do is just come up with your best prompts, put those prompts into the um, uh, into the chat here or Q and A or wherever, and we'll 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 do some uh, live in just a second though. Um, so again, like I said, I, I work at Desi, uh, so it, I need to talk about Inferi real quick. Inferi is just our inference server. Uh, it's an SDK that's tailored for generative AI models, and it has a lot of advanced techniques like selective quantization, hybrid compilation, specialized CUDA kernels. Um, it, it just really speeds up inference for both uh, diffusion models and, and um, language models. Um, so when we use uh, Inferi coupled with Desi Diffusion, we're able to generate high quality images in under a second. So it does leave other methods in the dust. Um, it also reduces costs. Um, so Desi Diffusion's uh, improved latency is, uh, you know, we can attribute that to the architecture for sure. And we'll see that on just a regular A100 using using a, a diffusers library. Um, but when we uh, pump in free into it, the, the difference is, is more pronounced uh, and also reduces um, carbon emissions. Um, so that's a plus two. Uh, it, you can go ahead and scan this. This will take you to the Hugging Face space where we have the diffusion model uh, hosted. So you can play around there if you'd like. Um, so take a second to do that. I'll also drop the links in, in the chat. Um, if you want to uh, support Desi Diffusion, please 
uh, check out the model card on Huggy Face and, and drop us a heart. Uh, here's a link to the notebook that I'm going to show you right now anyways. So we'll look at the notebook in just a second if there's time. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, that's a duplicate slide. Um, and there's also a, a Discord community, deeplearningdaily.community. Um, so if you're on Discord and you want to hang out, um, come check us out. I do uh, these things on Friday, hacky hours. We do a lot of community events, virtual events, um, You know, questions, whatever you have questions on, um, you can ask there contribute back to the community as well and that's it for the slideshow um all right so it just kind of go ahead yeah no, i was gonna say if you, uh, if you guys have uh any prompts that you want to i can i can uh do some generation uh no no uh no no prompts. Well, we can we can see it in in action here. Um, sorry, you're saying, Jimmy? I didn't want to. No, just go for it. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, please. If you guys have prompts, let's drop it in here. Um, so here I'm running this on an A100. Um, I should have loaded the model. Um, before my apologies. Um, and so now we can. Uh, it's just gonna take us a second to download the model. Um, and oh, I should have done that already. My bad. But we can actually just go jump to um to the hugging face space here. Um, and we can, uh, uh, this will give us a comparison, um, compare and contrast the same prompt against uh, uh, stable diffusion 1.5. So while this loads, um, we can we can look, we can look here. I think there might be a prompt here. Elon Musk riding a scooter in NYC. And so you can come here and you can play around with, um, with the different um, hyperparameters here. Uh, I'll leave them the same for right now. Um, but if we hit generate and we'll see here that we will get a image, uh, and that does look like Elon Musk. Um, so you can see here, uh, that image. So definitely check this out on, on Hugging Face Spaces. Um, so now again, I'm, I'm using a A100 here, so it's going to be, um, quicker than what we have in the Hugging Face Space. Um, but just to kind of show you real quick uh how long it takes to generate the image so here uh got watercolor painting golden temple of washington uh glow of morning light with the vanilla sky and it, it does really well and for those of you that don't know what the golden temple looks like here's like a actual um image of it so it it, it did capture quite well we can go to the same um diffusion model here and look at the um uh generation and you can compare and contrast how long it takes um to to generate so the first the first iter uh, generation will take a little bit longer just because the gp needs to warm up but uh once we have that done it'll take about a second to generate um so yeah that that's it nobody else wants to uh, offer a a prompt uh cool well, yeah. thank you guys so much for your time. Appreciate okay. it. Oh, yeah. And here, let's do con compare and contrast. So here I did the um, text image generation here with a realistic portrait of Albert Einstein with a bewildered expression. Um, and then I could take that right here. This is using Stable Diffusion 1.5, the exact same prompt. Um, now the GPU is warmed up. It should be better. And you can see here we're able to generate um, an image that's on par with Stable Diffusion 1.5. Uh, you know, in in this case, one second less. So, well, the child of Elon Musk and uh, let's let's put that up and see what happens. Uh, and <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. 